I'm here to talk about re-engineering the Facebook SDK for Android and how we did that. And I'll take you through what the SDK is, um, how we moved from versions uh, to the latest version that we've got, some of the design decisions behind that, and what the SDK gives you nowadays. So um, I'd actually like to start with a quick show of hands. Just how many people have used uh, any version of the Facebook SDK inside their app? Brilliant. And how many people think they're on the most recent version? Good. Okay, so I've got some work to do then to convince the rest of you to upgrade. Um, so let's start, okay? Some pretty interesting facts. In the last 30 days, we sent users to the Google Play and the Apple App Store 174 million times. That's actually, I, I pulled that from January. We haven't got the stat for February yet. So February is even probably a bigger number than that. Um, so that's one thing the SDK does is it, it generates new users for your app. As everybody here probably knows, we now have a billion monthly active users. Um, more interestingly than that, we actually have 600 million monthly active mobile users. So this is across both uh, Facebook for the web on mobile, iOS apps, and native Android app. Our SDKs have been put into 40% of the top 400 mobile apps, which is eight of the 10 top grossing apps on both iOS app store and Google Play store. So, what the SDK lets you do is it lets you share um, content from your app back to Facebook so that your friends can see that in their news feeds. And then that in turn drives traffic back to your app with a system we call the viral loop. Sweet. I pulled this um, stat from um, BGR.com. This is a, a quick look at the Android versions over time. Um, so when we released the first version of the SDK, somewhere around then, I think it was May 2010, um, the Android ecosystem was entirely different to the way it is now. And basically, we kind of iterated on that um, slowly but surely to get us to the point that we are now. Um, we're, we're at the point where we've got 3.0 of the Android SDK. We released that in December 2010, uncoincidentally at the same time as we released the iOS SDK, 3.0. So, all right, so we released SDK 2 uh, in about, I think, June 2011 or thereabouts. Um, obviously, Things moved forward quite a lot from then, and so we had to work on how we would put together the, the version three of the SDK. Um, so we needed to think about what had happened, right? And in that time, Android had actually improved quite a lot. We had a lot of new design patterns. Um, we had fragments in there. Developers were using new ways of developing their apps. Um, they built their own activity hierarchies. So we had a thing called Facebook Activity, right? Which was basically, it controlled the life cycle of the Facebook API and the Facebook SDK within your app. But that's not really what developers needed, because they had their own activities that they wanted to extend from. And you guys have probably seen this as well. Um, and then the ecosystem grew massively. Like, I mean, since we released SDK 2.0, the number of apps in the Google Play Store has just increased at a massive rate. So that was the apps, right? Facebook moved on as well. Um, we improved our native apps uh, on both iOS and Android. We improved the performance. We ripped out a lot of the, the um, web views and replaced them with native views. We put a lot of work into the platform as well. We improved the stability of the platform. We improved the per performance for mobile app developers, um, improved the speed and the reliability. And then we started sending a lot of traffic to the app stores on both um, Google Play and iOS. So we were at a point where developers wanted more from our SDKs than what they were getting, right? So um, we talked with a lot of the developers that use our SDKs regularly. Here's a couple of examples. Um, and we got feedback from those guys on, on what they expected from a more modern SDK. But we also listened to the developer community on Stack Overflow. We do a lot of work on Stack Overflow. We have a lot of our engineers and our SDK team pays attention to Stack Overflow pretty regularly. So um, developers there were talking about the difficulties that they were having. And hopefully some of you guys have used that channel for feedback. If not, I encourage you to do so, because we are very active there. Um, and we also, we also have our bug tool. And in our bug tool, we were getting a lot of bugs about the Android SDK, which weren't actually bugs. They were features by design. But the fact that developers were complaining about them was a sign that we needed to make some changes. So we have an SDK team in the Seattle office. Um, the guys there put a lot of work into the new SDKs, spent a lot of time thinking about what they needed to do, and I'll talk you through some of the process they went through. Um, interesting side note, uh, the Seattle office has my favorite meeting room of all time. <laughs> it's a hot tub, and it's a bookable meeting room, so that's kind of cool, but just a side note. Um, so 
the team had some objectives on how they were going to improve and modernize this SDK. So they wanted to work around restructuring the, the, the build of the SDK for additive features so that they could add and remove new features, um, mostly add, without interrupting the developer flow, without making massive changes to the SDK for existing developers. We, there's a lot of native UI elements, and then there's support for all the fragments that we've got inside the new um, version of the Android app, and the SDK needed to be able to talk to that and use that to its advantage. Um, and then they wanted to build features around high-value scenarios. So what this means is things like deep linking, um, open graph actions, um, doing like share with, with app, app attribution, so that whenever news stories come into your newsfeed, it's got the like via this app. Uh, and these are the kind of high-value things that developers should be putting into the SDK. Actually, the SDK wasn't designed around this at first. It just became part of the use pattern. So the guys wanted to put that in and make the SDK more um, more usable for developers to do these things. But they had a couple of key principles that they didn't want to move away from. So they wanted to make sure that the upgrade path was fairly low risk for developers from version two of the SDK. They wanted to, whoops. They wanted to make sure that there was feature parity with the iOS SDK, which had been upgraded to version three. Um, and there was a couple of the feature sets lacking uh, in the Android SDK. And then they wanted to make sure that um, the stability of the SDK matched the new stability of the APIs, so that you didn't have to do the error handling yourself when something went wrong from the API. So that led us to where we are now, which is the latest version of the Facebook SDK for Android, 3.0.1. <laughs> um, that's available at developers.facebook.com slash Android. Uh, if, you're a, if you're an Android developer uh, using our SDK version 2, Go there now, upgrade your SDK, have a look at the new feature sets, which I'll talk you through. If you're not yet using our SDKs, now's a great time to start. So what did we do, right? We, we had a couple of major objects in here. We had Facebook activity, and we had this like overriding Facebook object, which was like the main class that did everything. Um, you used it for requests, you used it for authentication, you used it for configuring and initializing your SDK. Uh, it was kind of unwieldy, and it wasn't a great way to build things. So we got rid of all that. Um, we now have a more modular approach where we've got a lot of core uh, classes that do things like manage session, manage requests to the API. Um, we've got a UI lifecycle helper, which I'll talk about in a bit, and then some like more fundamental things like settings. We built on top of that some graph abstractions for things like users that you get back from the Facebook API, graph objects that you use for open graph publishing, and then actions, which you'll use for the actual actions that you're doing to those objects. And then we have a bunch of native UI features on top of that. So you've got things like login button, which just handles session without you having to do anything yourself. You just drop that button into your, um, into your activity, and it'll manage your login for you. It'll pop up the, uh, the dialog for permissions and let you do that without having to put in any of that work yourself. Then there's some helper fragments for picking your friends. So if you want to build a, like a share uh, dialog to specific friends, or you just want to maybe like launch a new game to your friends and you want to select them, the friend picker fragment does that without you having to build that UI yourself. Um, profile picture view, another pretty obvious one. Once you've got a logged in session, it'll just update with your profile picture so that the user knows that they're logged in and you, they can see who they are. So, in 2.0, we had things like Facebook.request, which is how you manage the request to the APIs. And then if and when that went wrong or you made your request wrong, you would get back a Facebook error. And that was pretty crappy because you had to handle that all yourself inside your app. So we got rid of those. We now have the request object with a couple of sister objects, request async task, which matches some of the Android async tasks. Um, so this is a better fit for the Android platform now, and it lets you do things um, asynchronously for much better performance inside your app. Then there's request batch, which lets that go even faster. We can batch up a bunch of requests and send them off in one go. And then when you get the data back from the API, um, you get this response object. Um, if something goes wrong, instead of just sending back an error object, you now have proper exception handling. So you've got um, some examples are uh, Facebook authorization exception, Facebook service exception, um, and then if you formed your error wrong, or sorry, formed your request wrong, you'll get this Facebook request error. So this gives you a much better idea of what you're doing with the API, and it means you don't have to be as close to it and have your app like built around this really low-level wrapper. So here's some examples of how that's different in the code. Um, with the SDK 2.0, you had to create this Facebook object, which did everything. You passed in your app ID um, as a string. Uh, so that's fun. You have to like put your string in there inside your code. Um, create this FB connection object, and then authorize by calling the methods off that. Um, 
all of that activity was then managed from inside that Facebook object, which was a really unwieldy way of building things in. So we built this Facebook activity to try and wrap around it, but even that was quite awkward. Um, with the 3.0, you actually do things the way you're supposed to do it in Android. So you're going to be putting in string resources for the app ID, and that's going to be in one central place within your app. Then you refer to it inside the um, Android manifest file, which is like, that's just the right way of doing things now. So I talked about this Facebook activity class. Um, the sucky thing about that was that you had to then build your main activities for your app around this Facebook activity if you wanted it to manage your, uh, your session and all that. So this was quite unwieldy for developers. It meant that they couldn't choose their own activities to override. And now we've got rid of that as well. So now you can build your activity to extend whatever you want, or you can ex just extend the basic uh, Android activity class. Um, we have this UI lifecycle helper, which basically runs in sync with your activity. Uh, every time you do an on something um, event, you just have a matching uh, event inside UI lifecycle helper. So uh, for, for example, on create here, you'll do your super on create within your um, activity, and then you'll, do a, you'll instantiate the UI lifecycle helper, uh, call the on create method of that, and that'll just keep um, the, the lifecycle of, like, of your Facebook integration in sync with the rest of your app. So we have this session object as well. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to be like quizzing you on this flow afterwards. But essentially, you've got this like well-defined session object with a lifecycle of its own that manages things like uh, opening the session, extending permissions, um, what happens whenever the user logs out, uh, what happens when the user uh, invalidates their session by turning off the app inside the Facebook um, website on desktop. And it just manages it really well. So it, it gives you a better idea of what's going on in your session. It means you don't have to do things like validate your access tokens yourself, um, check the permissions all the time by going to me slash permissions. It's a much better way of doing your session management inside your app. And then it has clever things for like when you close the session and what happens whenever you try to reauthorize. Uh, if that fails, you get back some sensible data back. So we also have some native dialogues. Um, we've got things like the feed dialog here, which is um, basically for doing sharing, but it does app attribution, which is really, really fundamental and important for you guys to understand. Um, nowadays, instead of just using the share intent, uh, it's better for your app if you use this feed dialog, because it's going to give app, app attribution whenever the content ends up on news feed. So for example, if I share um, just using the share intent, the content will appear like on my timeline, and therefore my friends will see it. But if I use the feed dialog, not only will the content appear, but it'll say via my app. And that's really important, because it means whenever somebody else is on mobile and they see that content, they'll click, they'll click the story. It'll take you through to the, either the app directly with deep linking or to the Google Play Store if the person doesn't have the app installed. And then we have the um, UI elements for things like friend picker fragment, um, which is just a really handy way to get uh, a list of your friends and put that into the app experience. You don't have to build that yourself. You don't have to do an API call to me slash friends. You just get that directly back. And then also place picker fragments. So if you're building an app that has some sort of localized information or you're tagging where you are inside a, um, some app when you're building open graph actions, you can just use this place picker fragment. You don't have to build your own UI for it. You don't have to do a fetch of nearby objects. Um, it just comes directly in. So this is actually going to be, it's going to be weighted as well for like pages that you've uh, liked already. So for example, Cosmos is at the top there because I like that. Right, and we also have this um, ability to grow your app. So this means you're going to get more users in if you start using the SDK correctly. Um, using the features like feed dialog and deep linking, you're going to get more users into your app. But we also have this feature called mobile app install ads, which let you run ads that appear in newsfeed. And these will basically send users through to your app and give you, as a developer, the ability to control the type of users that you get in. You can create these like really detailed demographic um, controls on who sees these ads, so you get the type of users that you want. So this isn't like putting your app at the top of App Center or the top of the Google Play Store. This is like fine customization over the type of user that you want to arrive on your app and, and have a new install. And the SDK makes it really, really easy to do that. Um, each time a new install is reported using the SDK, it shows up here. Um, so you can see here, like the last mobile install uh, on this app, which is one of our test apps, was today at 10 o'clock. Um, I took that screenshot at about 10.15, so that's why. So it's probably up to date since then. Um, and doing that is really simple. There's just a sim single one line with the settings class, publish install async. So I'll just send back to our API to say that a new user has installed this app. 
And then there's some attribution on that to figure out where the user came from. Um, so if the user clicked on an ad and went through, then we can record that and show you that in the insights tool. So that's the SDK. Um, we're now at version 3.1. Uh, I recommend all, any developer in here that's using version 2 or up, um, don't worry about the upgrade path. It's a lot easier than you think. Start using the version 3. You'll see why the, the um, features are better. If you're not using our SDK yet, um, like why not? I want to refer back to that 174 million um, users to the Google Play and Apple iOS store. Uh, this is the kind of traffic that you'll get for your app using our SDKs. Um, I'm done with the talk, uh, so if anybody's got any questions.